I started to think to myself, well, how much motivation does somebody need to sell soap? Like how much traveling do they have to do? How much uh, going to events and what have you? And uh, I live in Boston, so it was expected to, well, I was expected or at least like encouraged to go to events in New York and New Jersey um, every other month. And to me, it was just a case of, well, the time spent traveling to hear the same information I could be building the business. Hey, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Crystal and on this channel, I talk about my experiences while I was in Amway through a Amway motivational organization called LTD. I was in LTD for almost two years and these are my thoughts, um, epiphanies, experiences while in the organization in hopes to shed the light on what actually goes on while you're in these um, AMOs and to maybe deter people from spending so much time, energy, and money while leaders on top are making most of the money while you're not. Uh, through this channel, I've been able to meet other IBOs who were also in LTD, but were a part of other AMOs such as Brit Worldwide, uh, which is my guest today. I got a chance to meet a young man named Mike Panchu, and he shares with us that he was in Brit Worldwide for almost three years and his experiences, as well as some feedback uh, while he was in. So uh, sit back and watch and come back afterwards and I'll share some other videos coming up. Well, hey, Michael, thank you so much for joining me this evening. Thank you for reaching out and thank you for just your um, courage and wanting to share your experience with um, Amway and kind of what you've been going through and where you are now. Uh, so again, thank you so much. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. No problem. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Mike Pantu. I built the Amway business under the uh, BWW mentorship. Uh, by profession, I was an IT major. I was in the mentorship program for two to three years. Recently got out and now I'm back to the uh, professional side of things and looking to find my next venture somewhere down the line. For sure. Well, thanks again for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit about what was going on in your life when you actually were approached to join Amway? What happened? How'd you get in? For sure. So uh, I graduated from a university back in December of 2019. I think I had a couple more courses to take. Uh, that's when the pandemic took off in the first half of 2020. I had one class I was taking remote, finished that up. Went on the unemployment with the pandemic going on, um, with all the hiring freezes, the uncertainty, the whole world was basically, yeah, it was just unprecedented times. Uh, due to those uncertain times, I had a lot of free time, so I was looking for jobs, even though it was tough. I was building my personal brand on LinkedIn. I was sharing my struggles I've overcame, challenges, what have you, some uh, college advice, uh, due to the brand I built on LinkedIn, I attracted a lot of MLM guys to my uh, page. There was one particular individual who reached out to me. I won't mention his name, but he sent me a very big text saying, I really liked your profile. I think it's important to connect with people during these uh, uncertain times, which I did agree with. And he was applying some knowledge from the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, where he was showing this. Uh, genuine interest in me and all that I was doing. So um, I kept in contact with him. We spoke on the phone. He told me about opportunities to get ahead in these uncertain times, about building multiple streams of income. And at the time, I agreed with him because uh, with the layoffs going on, the uncertainty, it made sense having multiple streams of income was uh, the way to go. So he brought me through... Um, I'm sure a lot of people can relate the evaluation process where you earn the mentorship and it excited me in the beginning for sure. And definitely for some years because uh, I grew up in a middle-class family. So it was this big goal to do better than my parents, so to speak, uh, with all due respect, uh, create wealth, uh, build those streams of income, live the life they didn't get to live, so to speak. And um, that's how it got started all through a LinkedIn message. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it's funny that we have kind of a similar mindset because I had the same thought when I first got started. Like, I just want to have multiple streams of income. I really wasn't, 
wanting to just like be an Amway person. I just wanted to have more than one stream of income coming in just in case anything happened. So did you, were those expectations met? Like what were your expectations actually going in? My expectations going in were the following. Um, I definitely knew that it wasn't going to be a walk in the park. I would have to put in the off spark. I would have to think differently. Um, that was a big one because I was coming from scholastic education. I had done contract work. I had leadership roles on campus. I was very stuck in this education mindset. So it was like apples and oranges. I knew I had to really switch up the mindset and drop my ego and in a sense, um, start fresh, which I was okay with doing. I was definitely happy about that, that uh, even though I was coming from uh, a lot of success in school, that I would have to admit that it wasn't going to carry me for the rest of my life and I had to learn new things. Yeah. Uh, definitely had expectations that it was going to take honest effort. And then um, definitely got to a point where I'm sure a lot of people can relate. It wasn't everything it was made out to be, so to speak, which I can um, get into more detail about later on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's jump into it. Let's the so way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of walk us through, not really a timeline, but talk about like how you kind of saw things like this isn't what I thought it was going to be. Um, how did things change? Did they start out going well and they kind of changed or how did that go for you? I noticed things started out well, I started in the, I would say, the Zoom IBO era. But um, once it got to a point where the restrictions were lifted, there were a lot more in-person events going on. And something to me wasn't adding up because I started to think to myself, well, how much motivation does somebody need to sell soap? Like, how much traveling do they have to do? How much uh, going to events and what have you? And I live in Boston, so it was expected to, well, I was expected or at least like encouraged to go to events in New York and New Jersey um, every other month. And to me, it was just a case of, well, the time spent traveling to hear the same information I could be building the business. <laughs> I totally agree. I was like, I don't need any more motivation. I'm not that kind of person. Just show me how to do it and then I'll... I'll do it. I'll figure it out. I'll learn how to do it. But I can completely agree with all of the excess motivation. Why do you think that there was so much motivation that they would put us through? I mean, I wasn't LTD, but it sounds like we had a lot of similar similarities when it came to that. Sure. Uh, definitely a very good question. I would say there was this friendly pressure or for a lot of other people, maybe big pressure to attend these events because what they sell you on with the mentorship is the mentorship program in itself. Amway is just the tool they use to conduct business. They, as in BWW, LTD, and many other organizations. Uh, so in a sense, your uh, upline, the people above you, they make the money based off the downline att attending events, so to speak. And then once you build out a team, that'll be the same for you. So um, after doing a lot of research online, I came to the conclusion that I don't feel comfortable making money on the backs of people, my downline from them, from them going to events, especially when it's definitely a costly investment of time and money. Yeah, for sure. Did you figure that out? Kind of, you said you're in for two to three years. Did you figure that out like year two? At what point did you figure out that they were making money off of what you were paying to get into all these events and whatnot? Two and a half to three. And um, a lot of what was, spoke to at events, even the ones uh, virtually since I started in the Zoom IBO era, it didn't really add up to me. Like I would hear speakers say to delete all your social media apps and I'm sitting here going, well, this is how I make the money. <laughs> like we're in the 21st century. <laughs> like some of these techniques are just so obsolete going door to door and telling people about the products or showing the plan of people in their houses. So they still wanted you to actually go door to door and delete your social media? Yeah, that's the impression I got. Like I was shocked when some of the speakers said it's a distraction, delete the apps. But like, that's how you build a network marketing business right now. It's through social media, especially if you want to reach the Gen Z crowd, because 
that's their space. It's primarily the screens. Um, the interaction face to face. It's I don't want to say it's a weak point, but it's just not their style. I completely agree. I feel the same way. So circling back to, I mean, going to these where you were expected to go to events in New York and, and whatnot, what, how are they like, like describe how the meetings were for you? Did they seem genuine? Did they seem like, were you motivated after events and after conferences? How'd you feel? For sure. I primarily went to uh, events in New York and Maryland. A highlight for me in Maryland was the crab cakes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll be perfectly honest. I did enjoy my first event because um, it was my first time seeing how big the business was, seeing people from all over the state, um, possibly even uh, other countries. It was cool at first because um, I'm sure other people can relate. I didn't really go up around like like-minded, motivated people. So it was cool being around that environment, extremely positive. The first time was great. I'll definitely give credit for that. I was happy, but I did notice a pattern. The more and more in-person events I went to, it was the same repetitive stuff. And going back to our earlier conversation, it had me thinking, do I really have to keep attending these events? How much amped up motivational stuff do you need to sell soap? Yeah. Yeah. So how did they, was there every ever... Was there ever any kind of like um, reprimand for not going? Were you ever made to feel like if you don't go to these things, you're not going to make it? I definitely heard comments such as only serious people go to these events. Uh, if you don't go, it will set your business back by a month, uh, <laughs> a year, which always confused me because logically speaking, how do you prove that if you... <laughs> don't attend a meeting, how's it setting you back? And I've been to these meetings with uh, similar people and we're all in the same position as the last meeting coming into the new one. So it had me thinking, do the meetings really, really grow your business or is it a money grab for us to just kind of sit there and praise away the leaders on stage? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's such a good point where you talk about like, praise the leaders on stage did you ever get that vibe that we were all just there to make them feel good or like make their heads grow i did yeah definitely notice a pattern with the speakers where they would talk about how far they've come and all this other mumbo jumbo uh i felt it was just a lot of worship so to speak like uh i'm all for looking up to people but it can definitely get to a point where you go over the edge with it Mm, that's such an important word to me, worship, because I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. So I had, I took issue with people almost acting like they were God. You know what I mean? They would say things and I was just like, you know, they would misuse scripture. So when you said like worship, I kind of got that same vibe. Like they wanted you to like praise them. And I was like, I'm not, I'm never doing that. So <laughs> gotcha. I grew up a uh, Hindu, but I've read some of the Bible and I definitely got the impression they used up some text from the bible to get people to stay plugged into the business uh correct me if i'm wrong maybe like a false prophet type of thing when the speaker's on stage and they're talking about um financial wealth and all this stuff wow that's a good point i didn't even think about it in that aspect how did all of that use of the bible scriptures false prophecy how did that make you feel i know i've talked to people in the past i know we didn't talk about this question but bringing that up makes me think about it um, I've talked to people in the past that kind of felt uncomfortable. They felt like they were being kind of spiritually manipulated into doing this stuff, thinking back to it. How did you feel? It definitely felt very, probably using the word many others have heard a lot. It felt very cultish, cult themed. Mm -hmm. Because I know with a cult, one of the first fundamental belief systems is having you like bow down to a certain belief system. If uh, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Definitely a very particular crowd. Yeah, after attending many in-person events, definitely got this eerie feeling that something was off, but I couldn't really act upon it, so to speak. Like my gut was telling me it was wrong, but I kept telling myself, now you're good, Mike, stay in. <laughs> yeah. Were you able to ever sponsor anybody? Did you ever get anybody into business with you? 
I did, yes. One of my... my first customers, I won't mention her name, but she started off as a customer. Then she eventually became a leg in my team. Um, she just wanted to sell some products here and there. Then she eventually became plugged into the BWW system. But I definitely did reach out to a lot of friends and family in the beginning as uh, that was encouraged to leverage your existing network to build out your team. Was she the only one that you sponsored? She was, yes. Yeah, same here. I had one girl I sponsored and she left like two days later. So I didn't really get a chance to have <laughs> time with her. <laughs> um, so how were all of the... Um, I found a lot of the, cause you know, we also have like a process. We had um, QI1, QI2, follow-up one, follow-up two, all these different meetings. Did you find that time was wasted doing all of these meetings? Because I'm sure that you probably got a lot of people into the process, but to only sponsor one person, how did that make you feel? It definitely made me feel good in the beginning. It definitely showed that if I can sponsor one person, I can sponsor many others. But um, the more and more I found out about the mentorship organizations and what goes on behind the curtain, it started to, in a sense, rub me the wrong way. But um, in regards to launching people, yeah, I definitely reached out to people in my network. Uh, some became customers, uh, a lot of them actually. Um, I tried taking a couple through the process, the Q1, the Q2s, the Q3s, but down the line, they would tell me that um, not the right fit for me. And they would tell me they did some research on Amway online. And uh, you know how that goes. You Google Amway and it's just a flood of negativity. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. And I remember specifically them telling me not to Google anything. Uh, because they wanted to be the ones to share all the information about, you know, LTD and Amway with me and not Google. Um, but now I really know why they didn't want me to. Um, I know you and I talked about how you had a lot of customers, how you really were doing really well when it came to your customer volume. Tell us a little bit about that. How was that experience for you? I would say uh, the customer side of things was a strength for me. Uh, I never realized how much as a male I was comfortable selling skincare to males and females. Um, my friends and family were supportive of it. Uh, my mom would buy products, uh, my female friends, um, even my male friends would get into the artistry line of products. I think it's more so because I kept promoting the products on social media. So I created this brand of the Mike Panchu skincare guy. So in a sense, I was pulling people towards me as opposed to pushing them away. Uh, they knew I was a expert in their minds in that <clears throat> area. So um, they felt comfortable asking me for advice. And um, due to that, since skincare was my strength, I was able to promote other lines of products such as Neutralite. I would say something such as, hey, you're taking very good care of your skin. What are you doing for your health health as in vitamins, uh, exercise, what have you? Were you ever recognized for doing so well with customer volume? I was, yes. Uh, there were a couple months where I did 300 PV all from retail. Uh, back in January, I did 600 PV. Uh, 500 came from uh, customer volume. Wow. Wow, that is amazing. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm Thank happy you. like it's me. That's awesome. That's great because... Um, so many people kind of like lie when it comes to customer volume. Like I've heard people say all kinds of stuff about how they make up customers just to get that customer volume, but you had legit customers that were buying from you because you were doing so well as a salesman. Thank you. I think a lot of that contributed to this area as well. I was able to separate the Amway identity from who I was. I didn't try to make every conversation about products. Um, there were exceptions. If, I was hanging out with a group of friends and they would say something such as I'm dealing with dry skin or my lips are chapped. That was a chance to casually talk about the products, but I won't out of the blue say your skin sucks. You need this. <laughs> That's good. I'm sure that helped a lot. Um, how much time do you think you spent on average a week 
going to meetings, doing all the things necessary to kind of grow your business? I would say 12 to 15 hours a week. Um, back when I was employed, I had my traditional schedule, eight, nine hours, what have you. Then I would work on the business from eight to 11 at night. Uh, some of that involved going to uh, customers' houses and dropping off products. Um, some other aspects to working on the business were definitely reading, listening to audios, the Q1 meetings, the Q2s. Uh, some of those would bleed over to the weekends. Uh, so I would say maybe more than 15. Um, definitely a lot of retail meetings. Um, social media posting was another, um, I would say, time-consuming aspect. Yes, I bet it was because you were posting for customer volume. So, but it it helped. I mean, it um it it paid off because you got all these customers to actually you know purchase from you. Got it. Oh yeah, for sure. I would say too. Um, I think I retailed in a way that they didn't really want me to retail in. I think I was like the right amount of authentic and genuine. Like I wasn't trying to get something out of everyone. I wanted to help people. Like I didn't treat my friends as a profit generating machine. And um, they would say something such as, well, your friends buy, you know, they buy Pokemon cards, they go to concerts, they buy this. Uh, relationships are transactional. I do agree with that. If mm -hmm. I hang out with a friend, we're spending mon money on a restaurant, a coffee shop. But to me, it's not a case of if I don't hang out with a friend, like I'm not going to like, lose the friendship quota <laughs> yeah 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 so you had a speaking of friends you had a different experience with friends you were able to maintain your friendships through out your duration of uh brit worldwide and um amway is that right that is correct um from my experience uh truthfully speaking i never broke a friendship or a family connection with anyone well i did had one friend who didn't want to buy the products, but she still wanted to hang out with me. But uh, I'd say it goes back to some of the previous points. I never treated anyone like a piece of meat for the business, or I wasn't concerned about trying to hit this like massive quota. It was a case of if you want the product or not, if I can help you or not. Yeah, I think that that's really good because a lot of people... Um, well, some people that I've talked to said that they have lost friends, like maybe because they were pushing too hard or maybe because their friends just didn't agree with what they were doing. But a lot of people, you know, were just like, I don't even talk to some of my family anymore. Um, when I interviewed Sarah girl, she was saying that she was just now building up her relationship back with her family because she had severed those ties thinking that she needed to do that to grow her business. So I think that I commend you for being able to keep most of your friendships um, while you were in the business. Um, tell me when you started feeling like it wasn't for you. Was there a particular time or place that you want to describe, or was it just kind of like over time? It definitely happened over time. I noticed red flags in the beginning that I completely overlooked because uh, I'm sure many can relate. I bought into the mentorship. I bought into the upline. I genuinely thought they had my best interests, which I'm sure they did, but there was definitely some hidden words behind it, so to speak. It happened, um, it was very random. I woke up one day and it was like a thousand light bulbs just went off in my head going, red flag here, red flag here. Uh, something isn't right here. You gotta disconnect from this uh, organization. And I started to really reflect on it too. I was thinking about the red flags I overlooked going, how did you overlook that, Mike? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So tell us if you if you feel comfortable, tell us which specific <clears throat> flags that you were like, how did you overlook that? Share that with us. For sure. I would say a general one was it was preached. This was a voluntary opportunity. If that's the case, I should have the freedom to choose to not attend a meeting, so to speak. But if I chose not to attend a meeting, it was met, met with uh, questioning, guilt tripping, persuasion. Uh, when I told my mentor I didn't want to go to New Jersey for a day to visit the other upline, um, definitely some guilt trip in there, such as, why would you disrespect your upline like that? And I'm sitting here going, I don't think politely denying a request is uh, 
disrespecting someone. <laughs> and it's a voluntary opportunity, so we should have the freedom to choose when and when not to go. If anything, it felt like you were running a business, but you had a, like, a boss behind you. <laughs> yeah, that's such a good point because um, my uplines weren't like that. But I had cross lines that were definitely like that. It was like you had a boss and you were working a job and it was like you were made to feel bad um, if you didn't go or if you couldn't go or if you were just tired. You know, we had a lot of night owls that uh, we had, you know, we were invited to. And I was just like, I don't I don't want to. I don't need to hear any more about anything. I just want to get some rest and actually, you know, put forth effort into growing the business. Yeah, that was one of my other... Uh issues I notice, like, um, I'm not sure if it applies to all organizations, all teams, but they'll say that help is a big part of their core values. But if you look at how these three day events are structured, it's structured in a way where you don't get much sleep. You so, so right. And I didn't really realize that until maybe because I, I was like you, I was in it when it was the pandemic. So most everything was online. But the very yeah, the first few meetings I went to were in person and the first conference I went to was in person. And I was like, I am exhausted. I can't even think. I just want to go to sleep. You know what I mean? But looking back, it's structured that way, huh? For sure. And um, yeah, if, if you do your research online, uh, a lot of these organizations, they it's definitely done by design. They use the sleep deprivation techniques to get you to just sit there and take in all the information and yeah it's disgusting it is and I just that's part of the issue that I have is that you know why do this to people you know you know that people are tired people are not um thinking straight they're gonna say yes to whatever you know I just that's one thing I didn't appreciate and so thank you for touching on that sure another point was um I would question how are these people getting all this time off to go to events? Because <laughs> they just felt like they were just popping up and popping up and popping up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a good question as well. Any other red flags that you kind of saw? Yeah, some other ones. Uh... Uh, it was in the very beginning, beginning. Uh, a buddy of mine wanted me to take a trip with him to Tampa. This was just when I joined the business. Uh, so my mentor wasn't too happy about that. He was telling me that, oh, well, uh, you're going to miss out on a big Zoom meeting, lots of info. And I was sitting here going, it's a Zoom, it's a Zoom meeting. There'll be like a thousand more of them. <laughs> that was one thing I noticed later on. Every like weekly meeting was like the biggest thing to them, which I get it. But at the same time, if you miss one meeting, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. Yeah, because looking back, all the meetings were the exact same. So if you missed one, you would hear the exact same thing, maybe packaged differently or by spoken by somebody else, but it was the same information, just different day. So it's all the same things. The audios, the conferences, the Zoom meetings, it's just packaged in a different way. So thanks for also mentioning that. For sure. And I definitely took notes during the Sunday meetings and... A year and I notice, wait, this is the same regurgitated information. Were you ever annoyed? Like what emotions did you go through when you realized like I'm I'm sitting here listening to the same thing I heard last week? I was definitely annoyed and there were definitely some um virtual board plans. Um I'm not sure if your team attended those. Uh those definitely took a toll on me. I would take a nap before attending them and I'd be sitting in bed going, Oh, I don't want to go. Yep. Yep. And uh, during the training, uh, when you would hear the same info, I would just kind of walk up and stretch and just zone out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and it just took me a couple of weeks to realize, like, this is the same exact thing that we heard last week. Why are we having to be here? But I realized that they wanted to make the room look as full as possible so that new recruits could see, like, oh, people are actually doing this, you know. It's not just me. Um, so like you said, it's all by design doing things that way. For sure. Um, a red flag I noticed too, just thinking off the top of my head, um, when I would bring someone to the board plan, my mentor would say, uh, tell them we'll reserve them a spot. I'm sitting here going, 
there's always going to be spots. It's a Zoom call. Or if it was in person, even if there weren't chairs, they would still find a way to get you into that room. <laughs> Mm-mm-mm. Like if they could paste you to the wall, they would. <laughs> <laughs> I bet they would. <laughs> Any other red flags you want to share? Yep, a couple others I've um definitely noticed. I think a lot of what was preached, they weren't following with action uh, from the books and the audios. Uh, one red flag I noticed was it was implied that if someone didn't buy from you they didn't respect you which didn't sit well with me because um i don't believe that anyone's obligated to buy from me just because they know me Mm -hmm. yeah that's a really mature perspective because i know that's kind of a lot of people say that you know like oh people if they don't buy from you are they really your friends they should support you and um i kind of had to come to the realization that you know, just because someone's your friend doesn't mean that they're your target audience, you know, it doesn't mean that they're going to buy from you. So um, the fact that you knew that and did push it on people around you, I think that may have led to why you were able to maintain so many of your friendships. Thanks. I would say that was a A contribution for sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and they would frame things in a certain way. Um, They would tell you, well, they don't respect you. Uh, They're not really your friend, blah, blah, blah. And Yeah, I'm glad I didn't go down that path because I didn't want to have transactional relationships. Uh, Didn't want to text a friend every month. Hey, need a refill on so-and-so? I know we overlook these red flags. And even when I was in, I kind of just was sometimes overlooked them until I just couldn't, I couldn't anymore. And it was like, you know what? Enough is enough. I'm just not dealing with this anymore. Um, So my hope is that people will hear, you know, what you're saying and kind of realize like, you know what? Yeah, some of this stuff does not make any sense. Oh, I do have one red flag I can mention. Okay. Um, won't, dis- won't disclose any names, but when I visited the um, big mentor's house, he <clears throat> knew that <clears throat> I was definitely struggling with 40 plus hours of work and working on the business. So I thought as a mentor, he should <clears throat> be that guy who would give advice on how to plow through it. But instead, he kind of used it as a way to boast about how many hours he worked and how he still runs the business. That was very egotistical. Yeah. Yes, it was. (laughs) It was like, I can do it. How come you can't do it? Kind of thing. That's what it sounded like. It was a very like one-up type of thing, such as, oh, well, I worked 60 hours and I built the business. Uh, Why can't you? Like, that's not the point. I'm looking for ways to balance both and overcome the challenges. (laughs) Like I still want to build a business. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. What was your experience like leaving the business? Uh, to be honest, it went better than I expected. I simply told the uh, group we chat that I didn't want to continue forth with the program anymore. A bit of me was terrified because I was leaving a week before FED, which I know is their big, big conference. <clears throat> but, uh, I was shocked there were no hard feelings, but I could set some craftiness in the message. My offline texted me saying, oh, this came out of the blue. I'd like to hear your side of the story. And I'm sitting here going, there's no side of the story for me to tell. Like, it's in the message. I don't want to continue with the business anymore. Uh, so he just kind of let me stay as I was after that. Uh, he didn't spam me with calls or messages but uh the upline above him sent me a text saying we need to talk it out but i just kind of ignored him (laughs) (laughs) but that was it i figured um they won't reach out to me too much because i'm not plugged into the system anymore so there's nothing they can truly get out of me i'm not subscribed to the audio talks i'm not buying books from them i'm not going to conferences and that's where they make their money. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good deal. Is there anything else that you want to share with the viewers that you want to say, warn them? Describe your experience in one word if you can. One word I would say uh, maybe shocking. I think it goes back to similar experiences uh, you and I've had where 
we grew up in a middle class family and we wanted to do better for ourselves and they sold us this <clears throat> ideology that we could become more we could become wealthy we could have a yacht we could have a lamborghini we could have anything blah 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 so then you find out like midway or maybe for some people it takes them longer that this isn't what it was made out to be but uh i would say another word is um perhaps silver lining as in there's definitely green flags like we you do learn a lot in this type of organization you learn how to uh read daily you learn how to communicate how to sell how to present so I would say it's good to take those skills that you learned in the organization and continue to build on them because I'm a firm believer in foundations are meant to be built upon. So I'd say the time didn't go to waste, but um, it'll definitely be a case of I have to build on these skills and continue to grow as an individual. So I would say that, yes, when you exit one of these organizations, it's definitely a painful experience mentally because you find out it wasn't what it was made out to be and it definitely stings after hearing about all that you could have been i will say that um for the audience or or anyone who has left or plans on leaving that uh i truly don't believe anyone is anyone is qualified enough to be your mentor so to speak you got to be a mentor to yourself because it's only you who knows what he, she really wants out of your uh, timeline. In addition, um, I do take full responsibility for like the involvement in the opportunity because um, in a sense, I put myself into it. So I'm taking the initiative to unprogram myself, so to speak. But um, I would say it's definitely a big learning lesson. You can learn a lot from this type of organization. It gives you a, huge sense of self-awareness and moving forward you won't be uh, i would say maybe as vulnerable to opportunities you'll definitely think for yourself you'll have that skill set that is right on point michael thank you so much for sitting down with me and talking to us and just sharing your experience and being transparent about what you went through for sure anytime <laughs> happy to uh play a part share the story Thank you so much for watching that interview and thank you for listening to Michael as he shared his perspective while in Burt Worldwide. If you're interested in sharing your uh, experience with the FTC, I talked about this in my very first video, but I'll leave the link below how to contact them, how to share your experience, because once there's a certain amount of people that actually file complaints, they're able to investigate and hopefully shut down such organizations as Burt Worldwide and even LTD. So if you are uh, wanting to do that, I have the link below. I've also linked other videos of other interviews that you can check out from different people's perspectives and thanks again to everybody who's been emailing me everybody who has been wanting to share their story thank you so much for just uh you know emailing me and just sharing your experience uh, i really appreciate it and i think it helps uh, me realize that you know a lot of us are um we're really affected by our experiences while in these amos so uh thanks again for watching and we'll see you in the next video